Alright everyone, this is not how I was hoping to kind of cover cranial nerves with you. Um, however, um, we're going to take this time to kind of finish up chapter 14 so that in next class we can start chapter 16. Um, lab this week is also over the cranial nerves, um, so you'll be able to review them as well um, during your lab time. Um, before we get there, I want to kind of do a quick review because um, we weren't kind of in the same place on my Monday and Tuesday class, so I want to make sure that we cover all that information. All right, kind of where we kind of left off, where we talked about all these different parts of the brain that do different functions. And one thing that's important to note is that your brain has what we call lateralization. Because you have two sides, you have a right side of your brain and you have a left side of your brain, they are not symmetrical. They're not the same, they don't look the same anatomically, but they also really don't function the same. And so this is why sometimes you can be considered um, right-brained or left-brained, depending on which part of your brain you may utilize the most or that you're more comfortable with. So if you look here, if you use the left, hemisphere of your brain and it's kind of more important um, you're gonna have right-handedness you're gonna be able to use your right hand better than your left um, you'll also um, have a higher affinity for spoken and written language as well as numerical and scientific skills so this side is going to be the left side of your brain is going to kind of control this part whereas the right hemisphere of your brain is going to help you with left-handedness. It's also going to be um, associated with your musical or artistic awareness, um, being able to pick up different things about music and stuff like that. Um, space and pattern perception, you would be able to say like what kind of shape would come next or if you can see a pattern easier. Um, insight, imagination, and also generating mental images of sight, sound, touch, taste, and smell. Um, when we look at this, guys, this does not mean, however, that you are only left-brained or only right-brained. You are a mixture of the two. There are just certain parts that you may ac access more often. Um, it is scientifically proven, though, that females have less lateralization, meaning that we can actually communicate between the right and left side of our brains a little more efficiently than men. Um, it doesn't really mean much except for the fact that we can start to make those connections a little bit quicker. Um, you may see that... Um, so let's take a look at these two hemispheres. If we have the left and the right side, um, the left side is more for the written and spoken language, the right side is more for your visual and sound awareness. The left side is numeric scientific skills, whereas the right side is more spatial or pattern perception. And guys, with this spatial or pattern perception, that's like seeing where things kind of fit if you were doing something that was in like a 3D with building and stuff like that. Um, when we look at this, you also have the left side with reasoning, whereas the right side is more imagination. And this kind of just gives you an idea where you can kind of see the difference based in kind of like a pictorial form. All right, so this is your two hemispheres of the brain. All right, the last thing here before we actually get into talking about the cranial nerves and some potential injuries um, are brain waves. We can actually monitor the brain waves. These are detectable signals of the neurons firing, but these are going to be in the cerebral cortex. Now, remember, the cerebral cortex is the topmost part, and this is because when we do an electrocephalogram, we're going to end up putting the electrodes here on the forehead, on the scalp, and so it's not going to be able to register deep sensations, deep nerve impulses, but it is going to be able to register this top part and this is also how nerves communicate with each other so when we look at this guys we are going to take a look at the four main types of brain waves we have alpha beta theta and delta these are located in your book on page 504 okay so we're gonna go and we're gonna look at how to kind of explain these all right, so if we're looking at the alpha waves, the alpha waves are shown in red in your book these are when an adult is calm they're awake, yet their eyes are closed. So your brain is still working. You're awake. You can hear certain kinds of um, stimuli. You might smell something. Um, you may be something touch, like feel touch. But we're taking the vision out. Okay, so when we take the vision out, this is kind of what alpha waves should look like in a normal adult. Beta waves, on the other hand, are seen during sensory input or mental activity. So this would be where they would ask you to maybe do something like a maze or a puzzle. Or they might be asking you questions that you have to answer, that you're visually seeing something. It's going to be taking in a lot more information and see how the activity of your brain works. Theta waves, on the other hand, they're normally seen in children, so if we see theta waves in children, it's not a big deal. But in, adult, in adults, we only normally see these whenever an adult is under extreme stress or with certain kinds of brain disorders. So this on an adult would indicate that there's something going on. Now the theta waves, now the theta waves are shown, shown in black in that chart. 
Now the delta waves are shown in green. These are normally seen in awake infants. So when an uh, infant is awake, um, one thing with these though is they um, are just beginning to process a lot of the sensory information. And so you'll notice that it kind of has these like bigger kind of hills and plateaus. We do see these, however, in sleeping adults. When adults are asleep, we do see delta waves, all right? If an adult is supposedly awake and we see delta waves, this is seen with brain damage. Now an EEG, can be used for diagnosis. We can actually use it to help diagnose certain seizure disorders, knowing maybe where the location of the seizure is um, beginning, where it gets initiated um, in the disease like epilepsy. We also see we can look at it for some central nervous system diseases like certain infections, tumors, traumas, hematomas, um, different things like that that put pressure on the brain. We might be able to notice that. Um, also on EEGs, they're useful to confirm brain death. Um, if there's a complete absence of brain waves in two EEGs that are done 24 hours apart then that person is considered brain dead and then that's where they would end up ultimately probably pulling the plug on the individual because their brain is really not functioning that machine is really what's keeping them alive their brain is not even functioning enough to potentially keep them breathing and their heart going it could be damage to those vital centers we talked about in the medulla um, however if they do one EEG and there's no activity and then in that 24-hour period they do another one and there is activity the process starts back over there has to be no activity in two consecutive EEGs in a 24 hour period with 24 hours um, separating the two. Now a couple of brain injuries um, that we do want to kind of talk about. Um, these are when head injuries occur um, and the brain is involved. The nervous tissue can get damaged during that impact when it actually like hits the brain or something like that. Um, it injures brain cells. This can um, actually cause the brain cells to start releasing certain chemicals that could actually be disruptive or bad. Um, some of these are like free radicals. They can damage the DNA of the, the surrounding brain tissue. Um, so it's not necessarily just trauma from the impact. It could be cells that have been injured releasing chemicals as well. Um, the lowest on this is what we would call a concussion. This is a temporary loss of consciousness and or memory. This is going to be what we would call amnesia. This could be within just a couple of seconds where you lose consciousness or you could be a couple of minutes without consciousness. Um, concussions are a really big deal, especially for um, adolescents. We found that they um, do make an impact, a bigger impact on the brain than we thought. This is why nowadays if you have an athlete if you have an individual that you know is a high school athlete, they have to take a test. Um, it's, it gives them a baseline of how their brain functions. And if they have a, a if they think they've had a concussion, they make them go take that test again. And if there's any kind of deficit, then they can't be released until they have seen a doctor. Because um, concussions are a really pretty big deal. The next one's a contusion. The contusion is um, where the brain actually becomes bruised. However, it's the tiny blood vessels that become a problem. It's not necessarily a large bleed. It could be. Um, this is where the PM mater may be torn. If the PM mater is torn, a lot of times you'll have what we call a subarachnoid hemorrhage, where the bleeding takes place in that arachnoid space, that subarachnoid space. Well, then the blood's taking the place of the cerebral spinal fluid, which can potentially cause a problem, putting more pressure on the brain. Um, um, this is going to be where uncomfortable consciousness is put with this. It could last minutes, but they could also be unconscious for hours. So you can see the progression. The next one's a laceration. This is where the brain tissue actually itself has become torn. This is going to be some sort of major trauma, like a skull fracture, or gunshot wound, something like that. Um, this is where larger blood vessels are going to be involved. Um, again, because they've ruptured, it will cause a subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, a brain bleed. Um, this leads to cerebral hematoma. Hematoma is a blood clot. Um, this clot could then put more pressure on the tissue because the clot is more solid than even just the liquid blood. Um, this can also cause edema or swelling in the area. Again, this can increase intracranial pressure. There's only so much room when we're talking about this brain case, and so it can press on the brain tissue, causing herniation, different things like that. All right, so now this next section in our notes is going to talk mostly about the cranial nerves. You need to know these cranial nerves. You need to know them in order. You'll notice here you have olfactory is one, optic is two, and so on. You'll notice that they are um, represented with Roman numerals. Um, you need to study this particular picture. Okay, you have access to it here in the video, but you also have access to it in the PowerPoint. You need to study this picture. It will be on your exam. All right, um, so you need to make sure you're looking at this. You also will need to know what these do each one of these does because on the exam I may not just ask you where is the trigeminal nerve um, I may ask you like which nerve is for vision 
Okay, you have to be able to know also what it does. Now, one way to kind of remember these in order, there's a mnemonic, it's down here at the bottom of the screen. It says, on, on old Olympus's towering tops, a friendly Viking grew vines and hops. And so what they did is they took the first letter of each of these and made it into a sentence. If this mnemonic doesn't help you, you can make one up of your own, or you may not want one, okay? But this is just a way to kind of help you study. Now, these are going to be found when we start talking about each one individually. They're found on another sheet. They're not in your actual notes. They're their own handout, which you'll need to kind of have as we go through this. Okay, now before we get there though, I do want to look at some differences between cranial nerves and spinal nerves. Um, we talked about spinal nerves at the end of last semester. So when we look at this guy, spinal nerves are going to be designated or named based on their location. So if they have, we have some uh, spinal nerves that are C1 through 8. The C stands for cervical, so cervical 1 through 8 spinal nerves. We also have T1 through 12, that's the thoracic. L is lumbar. S is sacral, and the CO is the coxal, okay? So this is telling you the location. Now the number, you have 31 pairs, and since there's pairs, remember pairs mean they come in two, so you actually have 62 spinal nerves. The origin, where do they come from, is of course the spinal cord, that's the name. Um, with their roots, guys, they have two. They have a dorsal root, which is on the back side of the spinal cord, and they have a ventral root, which is on the front, okay? And they end up making kind of like a, a circuit, a circle back into the um, spinal cord. The contents of these spinal nerves are Mixed. mixed means that they contain both sensory and motor functions, okay, or nerves. They've got nerves that are detecting sens sensory sensations. You also have some that are, are sending out motor sensations. Um, the target, who are they talking to? This is going to be your limbs and your trunk. That's who they're going to talk to, okay? Um, we also see that we have the cranial nerves. The cranial nerves are numbered based on Roman numerals, so they go 1 through 12. There's 12 pairs, which means you have 24 total. Um, when we're looking at Roman numerals, the I means 1, the V means 5, and the X means 10. So those are the only three you kind of need to know, but if you obviously have three I's, that's talking about number 3. If you have an I before the X, that's number 9. So you need to make sure that you can tell the difference, okay? Their origin, of course, is the brain. They only have a single root that comes out of the brain. It's not going to have a dorsal and ventral side. It's one single root. Um, the contents, most of the time, um, we're going to see that a lot of these are mixed. However, some are sensory only and others are motor only. Okay, so we're going to look at that as well. Um, in your lab book, there's a really good mnemonic to help you remember them as well in that order. And I'll hit on these as we go through each of them. So the saying goes, some say marry money. But my brother says, bad business, marry money. And I know that's kind of not a like accurate English sentence. It's like poor English. Um, but the S's stand for sensory. The M's stand for motor. And the B's stand for both, meaning that it's sensory and motor. Okay, so when we look at this, this kind of saying helps you. So when we look at cranial nerve number one, the saying said some, that's an S, it's going to be sensory only. Okay, so this is going to just be one way to help. And this is located at the bottom of your chart on your um, uh, cranial nerves page. It's also found in your lab book. All right. Now, also, the cranial nerves, guys, are going to talk to your head and your neck mostly. There is an exception. The vagus nerve here does leave, and it talks to your thoracic and abdominal um, organs. Um, but we'll talk about him a little bit more later. All right, so let's look at cranial nerve number one. Now, in your book, guys, cranial nerve number one is discussed on page... Cranial nerve number one is discussed on page 503. Um, you'll notice in your textbook, these are called exhibits, and all the cranial nerves are talked about almost on their own page. Um, these pictures also come from your book there. So when we look at cranial nerve one, guys, this is the olfactory nerve. These nerves are going to be located within the nasal mucosa that's inside your nose. So that mucous membrane inside your nose has these sensory organs here for smell. Um, they're going to travel through the olfactory foramina. Remember, foramina are tiny holes of the cribiform plate. Oh, now this brings back a, a uh, certain kind of bone marking you had to know. Remember the ethmoid bone has that weird shape to it, almost kind of like a cross. Up here is the cristagalli, that's kind of like the coxcomb, but this way was the perpendicular plate and there were tiny holes in it. That's what we're talking about here. Those tiny holes is where the olfactory nerves are going to be coming up to allow you to be able to smell. They're then going to, of course, travel into your brain. Um, once they travel into the brain, then they go from the olfactory nerve to the olfactory tract. Okay, so this is what we're looking at here for the olfactory. 
Now the olfactory nerve is sensory only, okay? There's no motor function with this, it's sensory only. All right, so now we look at cranial nerve two. Cranial nerve two is the optic nerve. The optic nerve is going to have its extensions in the retina of the eye. Okay, the retina you can see here in the eyeball. It also takes it and breaks it down to where you can see the rods and the cones. These are the two um, collecting the information to send to the optic nerve. Now the optic nerve is found here at the very back of the eyeball. It's going to travel through the optic foramen, the hole. Okay, as it goes through there, it's gonna travel back and go through the op um, optic chiasm. You can see here, this is where it's going to cross. Um, this is where you, what you see on, in your right eye is going to be interpreted by the left side of your brain and so on. And this one is for vision. The optic nerve is vision only, which is also a sensory only um, nerve. Okay, so we have olfactory is number one, optic is number two. Now on this slide, guys, you're gonna notice that we're gonna talk about three of the cranial nerves. And you'll notice they're not in the exact order. There's three, four, and number six. We're gonna skip number five here, and there's a reason. These three guys have very similar functions. They all function in the movement of the eyeball somehow. All right, so let's take a look at them each individually. So our first one here is the oculomotor. This is number three. This one originates from the midbrain, so the midbrain. Okay, part of the brain stem. It's gonna then go and talk to your eyeball muscles. The superior orbital fissure is how it gets there, that little slit within the um, eye socket. This is gonna allow you to not only move your eyeball, but also move your eyelid for you to blink. Um, it's gonna accommodate your lens so that you can be able to focus on whether something's far away or up close that you're seeing. And it's also going to help with pupillary constriction. So constricting your pupil when light's present versus when it's dark, the ocular motor nerve's gonna help with this. Now, one thing to note about this is it says ocula, which is eye, motor, which tells you it's gonna do with movement. This one is a motor neuron. On the other hand, we see number four. Number four is trochlear. The trochlear also originates from the midbrain and it goes to the eyeball muscles through the same supraorbital fissure. And this is gonna just help with movement of the eye itself, okay? Um, a lot of this is gonna help you be able to look up, okay? So being able to look up. Um, the last one here is number six. This is the abducens. And so if we look at the beginning of this word where we say ab, it's like abduction. Remember abduction is when you move your arm away from your body or your leg away from your body. So this is actually gonna allow you to be able to look from side to side, looking laterally with your eyes. So moving the eyeball laterally, all right? So this is what we're looking at for the three that help move the eyeballs. Now. If you look at your little saying, all three of them begin with M's, and so with that meaning these are motor only, okay? So these three, number three, four, and six are motor only. All right, so now we're gonna kinda take a step back and look at number five. Number five is the trigeminal. Now what does tri mean? Tri means three. So when we look at this, guys, this one has actually three sensory portions we want to look at. Okay, we also see it has a motor portion. Since there's sensory and motor present here, this means it is a mixed nerve. It has both present. So when we look at this sensory portion, there's what we call ophthalmatic branch. This is, this is where the eyelid, eyeball, nose, and forehead are going to send sensation information to the pons. We also see that there's a maxillary branch. This is from the nose, upper lip, and um, lower eyelids. They're gonna communicate sensory information like pain, uh, touch, temperature to the pons. And then the mandibular branch is gonna do the same thing, but taking information from your tongue, lower teeth, cheek, and your jaw, okay, from the skin around there, talking to the pons. Now, these sensory components are for sensation, like touch, pain, and temperature. Now, guys, one way to kind of think about the trigeminal is if you take three and you touch the three areas. You have your forehead, you have your maxilla, and you have your mandible. These are the three areas. It's collecting information from all three areas about pain, touch, and temperature. There is a motor portion though from the pons. There's an area that's going to talk to the mastication muscles. These are going to help you with chewing and this is gonna take the mandibular branch back down to your tongue and your lower jaw because remember that's the only part that moves. So these mastication muscles that we see in here are going to communicate with the trigeminal nerve. 
All right, so now let's look at cranial nerve seven. Cranial nerve seven is the facial nerve. You will also notice here that it has sensory and motor, which means it is a mixed nerve as well. On the sensory side, your taste buds here, especially the front two thirds of your tongue, okay? Not the very back, but the front two thirds. These are gonna communicate with your pawns. Um, you also have proprioceptors of the face and scalp that are gonna communicate with the pawns, but the sensation that this mostly does is taste, giving you the idea of being able to taste certain things. On the other hand, the motor portion of the facial nerve, it goes from the pons to either your facial, scalp, or neck muscles. Um, these are going to, of course, help you make facial expressions. They're also going to communicate with the lacrimal glands. This is going to help you with the secretion of tears. And the salivary glands. These are also going to help you with salivation, which is going to be important for tasting. In order for you to taste anything, we have to get the chemicals from the food to be um, kind of diluted in a sense or dissolved into your saliva so they can come in contact with your taste buds. So that way we can get the information. And one thing with the facial nerve is that it is talked about on page 508, but a really kind of interesting thing about it is if you have paralysis of this nerve, paralysis of facial nerve seven, um, this means that the nerve is not sending impulses to the muscles. This is when somebody gets Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy leads to a loss of the ability to close your eyelids, being able to close your eyes, um, but also impairment with taste and salivation. Um, they'll also see that there'll be like a drooping of the face on that particular side because it's not communicating with those muscles to allow for facial expressions. All right, so now let's look at cranial nerve eight. Cranial nerve eight is the vestibulocochlear nerve. Um, on this particular nerve, you have two branches that we're looking at. Again, though, with number eight, this is a sensory only nerve. However, it can cause some major issues if they're messed up. So let's look at the cochlear branch first. The cochlear branch is going to go from the spiral ganglion inside of the ear, um, going into the internal auditory meatus. That's that little hole or canal it's gonna travel through towards your thalamus. Once it reaches the thalamus, this area is going to help direct it where it needs to to be interpreted so that you can have your hearing. Okay, so if there's damage to this cochlear branch, it's obviously going to affect your hearing. This is why sometimes you see people who have cochlear implants. Um, cochlear implants are going to help stimulate um, this nerve because the cochlea is not doing it for them. And the cochlea you can see here looks like the little snail. They have to communicate with the nerve. The nerve is not damaged though in this case. It's just not re receiving the stimulus, so they put the implant in to help with that. Um, if this nerve is damaged, we can actually have sensory um, hearing loss, but we, we can also have what we call tinnitus. This is a ringing of the ear where they feel like their, their ears are ringing. We also see there's a second branch here, and that's the first part of the word, which is the vestibular branch. This is where the semicircular canals located here um, are going to communicate through the nerve to the pons and the cerebellum. This area is going to be um, controlling your equilibrium. This is why we talk about how your inner ear helps you with your balance. This is what we're seeing. Um, here, there's going to be movements within these semicircular canals, which allow you to know where your head is located, make sure, sure that your room, you know that the room is stationary. When people have an injury to this area, whether it be the semicircular canals or to the nerve itself, they may experience something called vertigo, where they feel like their surroundings or the room is spinning when it really isn't. Um, we also see that they could end up having, if this particular nerve is damaged, they can actually have ataxia because remember this is equilibrium and ataxia is where you have a hard time coordinating your movements and making them fluid. And remember it's talking to the cerebellum here which allows you to do that. We also see that they can have nystagmus. Nystagmus means there's rapid movements of the eye. It's really fast, you can Google it. You can even look at YouTube and watch somebody's eyes who has nystagmus. Um, a lot of times this is because the eyes try to help give the information of of balance and, and help with equilibrium. And so because this nerve is messed up, the eyes are thinking they need to do more and it's causing them to have rapid movement. All right, so these are just two areas that we're looking at. And this nerve is talked about on page five. Of all right, so then now let's look at number nine. Number nine is where we're looking at the glossopharyngeal nerve. Um, this one has a sensory portion and a motor portion as well. So we're looking here at a mixed nerve or a both. Um, the sensory portion, remember we talked about earlier that we had taste on the two, first two thirds of the tongue. Well, the posterior last third of the tongue is here. Um, this is the sensation for the glossopharyngeal. There's also proprioceptors here on the tongue that help you with swallowing. So when you have a, something that moves to the back part of your tongue, it initiates that swallowing effect. There's also going to be barioreceptors here. That's what this one here is talking about 
out in the carotid sinuses. These are going to be right in here that talk to the medulla. Um, this is going to help with regulation of your blood pressure. So not only do you have taste here in the back part of the tongue, but you also have regulation of your blood pressure that it's taking in information. On the motor side, this is going to be where the medulla talks to the pharyngeal muscles. Pharyngeal muscles are your throat muscles in your uh, parotid glands in the jugular foramen, and this is going to allow you to either swallow, but also help you make speech, okay, helping with talking, um, and also secretion of saliva when you're talking about the glands. Um, this nerve actually can be tested to see if it's working right uh, by you doing the gag reflex. If you go back there, and this is why a lot of times that they'll end up putting the, the, um, the um, tongue depressor back far enough to cause you to gag a little bit, it's actually checking to see if this particular nerve is working. People who have a very um, strong reflex here um, will actually have a hard time like swallowing pills and doing things like that where, because the whole point of the gag reflex is to help prevent you from choking. And so when they feel like that's happening because it gets stimulated more, it's harder for them to swallow pills and stuff. Again, damage to this particular area could also cause um, dysphagia, which is difficulty in swallowing, where they have a hard time swallowing. We also see that it could cause an issue with the secretion of saliva. Um, another one that it could do is um, agusia. This is just the desensation of taste, where they can't taste things really well. All right, so now let's talk about this really kind of interesting um, nerve. The vagus nerve is nerve number 10, and he's known as the wanderer. This nerve is called the wanderer because you're gonna notice that it wanders out of the head region. And it actually talks mostly to your heart, your lungs, and your other internal organs of your abdomen, like your liver, your stomach, and your intestines. This one also has a sensory and motor portion. So let's look at the sensory side first. The sensory side is for the viscera. It's gonna talk to, from the viscera, the, the internal organs, to the medulla and the pons. And it's gonna travel through the jugular foramen along with the jugular vein. Um, here, we're gonna see there is some taste sensation that is gonna come into play here and it's gonna work again with other nerves for taste. We also see somatic sensations um, from the pharynx, which is your throat, and your epiglottis. Epiglottis is gonna help you be able to know if it needs to be going down into your trachea or your esophagus. And then also, of course, visceral sensations like pain from your heart or your lungs or different sensations coming from them. Now the motor portion, we see that the medulla is gonna to talk to the visceral muscles and these glands, and the motor portions are gonna help you with swallowing. It's also going to help with coughing. Okay, remember the medulla has that, that center in there for coughing. Also voice production, how does your voice kind of sound? Um, smooth muscle contraction of your GI tract, so when you eat something, allowing your stomach to then contract and move it to your intestines, allowing it to contract and so on. We also see it's going to talk to your cardiac muscle. The whole point here that this nerve is going to do, though, is it's going to help slow your heart rate. This is the one that they use to help slow down your heart rate after maybe a stressful event or something like that. We also see it's going to talk to certain digestive glands like your liver, gallbladder, those areas, in order for them to release their different digestive enzymes. So again, Again, damage to the vagus nerve, depending on which area is hindered, could cause an issue with like swallowing, okay? It could also disrupt sensations from other organs, so you don't know that pain is happening there, like with some of your internal organs. Um, on the heart rate side, since it's responsible for decreasing the heart rate, a patient where the vagus nerve is damaged might have tachycardia, which means their heart races. All right, so this is just giving you some idea about the vagus nerve. Again, the vagus nerve is discussed on page 511 in your book. All right, so then our next one is number 11. Number 11 is the accessory nerve. Um, there's two portions here. There's a cranial portion and a spinal portion. Guys, the cranial portion talks, um, takes messages from your medulla and it talks to your voluntary mouth and throat muscles and this allows you to swallow and be consciously aware of that swallowing. It's not just a reflex that's happening. Also, then you have the spinal portion. This is gonna actually travel through the anterior horns of the cervical spinal cord. Um, it's gonna talk to your ster sternoclavidomastoid and your trapezius muscles. This is going to help you be able to turn your head, okay, because remember the sternoclavidomastoid, also flex, okay, and extend. It's also going to help you with being able to shrug your shoulders. That's what your traps do. All right, so one way to test this nerve to see if it's functioning, at least with the spinal portion, you have somebody put their hands on your shoulders and then you shrug and they can actually feel that that is happening. Or you shrug and they push and you can resist. All right, that's allowing you to know that that nerve is working properly. 
All right, and last but not least here with our cranial nerves, we have what we call the hypoglossal. The hypoglossal is gonna be where the medulla talks to your tongue muscles. Again, this is gonna work with other cranial nerves and it's gonna help you with speech and swallowing. It's gonna help the whole movement of the tongue function. Okay, so this is the hypoglossal. Again, if there's an issue with this nerve, somebody is gonna have a hard time speaking, but they may also have a hard time swallowing as well. All right, so this at least covers the cranial nerves. Now, before we end this lecture, I do wanna hit on a couple of the disease portions um, that talk about with the brain. Um, in your book, guys, so we have the different pages that talk about each one, but there is a chart on page 514 that has all of the cranial nerves that are put together for you. They're just listed in a chart form that can help you as well, as well as the chart that you have within your notes. So there's plenty of ways to study these cranial nerves. Also, you'll notice in Quizlet that I have their own set of cards. I separated them from the rest of chapter 14 to give you an idea of the, the importance of those cranial nerves so that you can try to learn them by the number, by their name, and what they do. Now, talking about the diseases, this is one thing that we're going to be kind of hitting on briefly in each chapter because now we are starting to put all of these kind of chapters together and seeing how they're influencing each other. And so at the end of every chapter of your book, you're going to notice that there's a, a section that is going to talk about homeostasis and disorders to that homeostasis. In chapter 14, this starts on page 517. Okay, so we're going to take a look at a few of these. So the first one I want to talk to you about is the cerebrovascular accidents. These are called strokes or CVAs. Um, this is caused when blood circulation to the brain is blocked somehow. And because it's blocked, that brain tissue is not getting the nutrients it needs. So it begins to die. Um, most commonly, this is caused by a blockage to, blockage to a cerebral artery. Those little arteries that are in the brain get clogged and it stops them from being able to deliver their blood. Other causes that could happen here are compression, where we see it's pressure, uh, putting pressure on the area of the brain, which also then can kink the blood vessel, kind of like if you take a hose and you kink it and the other side is not getting what it needs. That could be how it's blocked, or it could be blocked by a hemorrhage, like a bleed. It could be swelling. It could be also what we call um, arteriosclerosis. This is where there's a buildup in there, okay, like the fat buildup. You've seen those in the commercials where it talks about like high cholesterol and it's blocking a artery. That's what we're seeing that could happen here. Now, there are some uh, mild kind of strokes that are called transient ischemic attacks or TIAs. These are temporary episodes um, of a blockage. However, they're not um, complete yet, so they are reversible. We can actually get the blood back there. And guys, ischemia means that the blood and oxygen is not getting there. And so they're temporary. We can actually see that it, it doesn't block it forever. Once it kind of moves away, it doesn't, but it should still be treated. This normally is kind of like a precursor to a bigger stroke. It's kind of almost like your warning sign, kind of like how chest pain at the beginning of like angina is a, a kind of indication that you might have a heart attack soon. So it's really important to kind of take these into account, though, if this does happen periodically. Um, if somebody has a stroke, there is one kind of medication that is, is approved for treatment of stroke. However, it has to be given pretty quickly in order for it to work and dissolve the clot. Otherwise, the damage is already done. That brain tissue is dead and it can't be rejuvenated. So when we look at this, this is called the tissue uh, plasogen activator or TP, uh, TPA. You may have heard some, hear somebody say, we, need a t we may need a TPA over here. That's talking about a certain kind of medication and it can only be given during a certain amount of time when an individual is having a stroke. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about degenerative brain disorders. Um, one example here um, is Alzheimer's. Um, Alzheimer's disease is a progressive degenerative disease. Now guys, degenerative means that it's going to just get worse over time. Um, it's, and it's a breakdown that's happening. And progressive means that it's going to continue to happen. Um, this results in dementia. Now there's all kinds of different types of dementia that doesn't mean it has to be Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is just a more specific cause of that dementia. Um, dementia kind of happens with all older individuals. As you get older, the brain just isn't able to process things as quickly. But Alzheimer's is an actual disease where the brain is being atrophied and um, the individual has a hard time um, recognizing faces or pulling certain kinds of memories, or they may be able to remember long-term stuff, but not short-term stuff. 
Um, they forget to feed the, how to feed themselves. Um, eventually this disease does take their life, but a lot of times it's due to not being able to swallow anymore. Um, they can't move. They can't, um, their body forgets to breathe. It's all those automatic functions that we kind of take for granted. Those areas of the brain start to be affected in an individual with Alzheimer's. Um, the next one's Parkinson's disease. This is a degeneration of a dopamine releasing neuron. And a lot of times this is, these neurons are found in that substantia nigra we talked about earlier in this set of notes. Um, dopamine is really important as a neurotransmitter to kind of connect all those areas of the midbrain, the pons, the cerebellum, all those areas that are supposed to help with coordination of the muscles and suppression of, mu of muscle movements that we don't want. And if dopamine's not present, then those nerves can't be stimulated. So then you see the shaking that the individual deals with. Um, the last one here is Huntington's disease. Um, this is a fatal hereditary disease. Um, and it is a dominant disease, guys, meaning that if you have the capital letter, if you have one of the capital letters, you still have the disease. You don't have to have two capital letters, which also means that if you have at least one capital letter, there's a 50% chance you pass it on to your children. The problem with this particular disease is that it's not detectable until about midlife. Late 30s and 40s, you actually start to see the symptoms of this, which is when most people have already had children. Um, what happens is there's an accumulation of a protein that they call Huntington that leads to um, degeneration of the basal nuclei. So again, this actually causes spasms and they, they'll shake. Um, it'll cause really um, strong spasms of certain muscles at different times. When they're stressed, they'll see that there's more issues. It affects their talking. And again, it's a it's also going to be kind of similar to Alzheimer's in the sense that they revert. Um, they get to where they can't feed themselves, they can't take care of themselves. They almost become kind of like a vegetable in the sense as an adult, kind of like how an infant has to be taken care of completely. Um, but Huntington's is a genetic disorder. <coughs> Now the last little bit in here talks about epilepsy. Now epilepsy guys, if a victim has epilepsy, they do lose consciousness. Um, they will fall stiffly. It's because like their body just like all contracts at once. Um, they may have uncontrollable jerking. Um, these are all different characteristics of different epileptic seizures. Um, there's different types of seizures though. There is one called an absent seizure and this is actually seen in children a lot. It's called a peat mall seizure as well, which means a small one, um, mild seizure where they, the kid just kind of has a blank expression. They're not present, they're absent. Um, and it's not where you can just come up and be like, hey, come to, you can't just do that to them. Um, so when you're looking at this, they're just, their eyes are kind of glazed and they're just gone for a little bit. A lot of times kids will outgrow this though. Um, it's not that big of a deal. And guys, with epilepsy, um, it does not cause um, damage to the brain. Damage to the brain comes from when they fall or something like that and then they get a contusion or a concussion. That's where the damage comes from. The actual misfiring of the neurons that causes the seizure doesn't actually cause damage to the brain tissue. It's just causing them to like fire all at once and kind of short circuit their brain where it has to kind of restart. That's what um, a seizure really is. Um, there's also what we call grand mal seizures. Now, these are the more dangerous ones. Um, they're also known as cl clonic tonic seizures now. Um, the victim loses consciousness. Um, a lot of times bones can be broken from the intense convulsions because it makes a, such a strong contraction of those muscles. It could potentially break some bones. Um, they lose control of their bowel and bladder, so a lot of times they will wet themselves, that sort of thing. Um, they can end up biting their tongue um, and and that's where a lot of times you've heard where people like put something in their mouth to keep them from swallowing their tongue or biting their tongue. The problem is if they can bite off a piece of their tongue, then they can bite off a, like a piece of your finger. So you don't want to put anything really in their mouth. You don't want to put a spoon or anything like that. Just keep your fingers and everything away from their mouth. The big thing with somebody who has a grand mal seizure is you should help support their head so it doesn't hit anything because again, that's where a lot of times the actual damage can come in. Um, also turning them to their side. This is if they do like vomit a little bit or anything like that, that it comes out instead of them aspirating.
aspirating it and breathing it in and causing more damage that way. Uh, because their body's kind of going haywire, they've lost control, you need to help with that. Um, if they're an inpatient and they're in the hospital and it's somebody who has seizures a lot, then you need to make sure the bed rails are up. Because if you're not in there when they start having the seizure and the bed rails are down, they could fall out of the bed and then that causes more damage, more problems to them. All right, and so that's what we're kind of looking at here. Now, epilepsy can... Um, usually be controlled with drugs that are called anti-convulsive drugs. Uh, valporic acid is one. This is a non-sedating drug, which means it doesn't sedate them or make them really tired. This one actually enhances a certain kind of neuron called a neurotransmitter called GABA. And GABA actually kind of inhibits some of those neurons so that they don't, they don't get excited as quickly. Then it helps decrease the amount of seizures present. This is the drug of choice. Um, in some severe cases, the drugs don't help as much with the seizures and this is where they may have to come in and do vagus nerve stimulation. This is where they're going to come in and they're going to stimulate the vagus nerve um, where they're going to in, put an implant in under the skin and the chest and this can actually um, keep the electrical activity of the brain from being so chaotic um, by stimulating that vagus nerve because that vagus nerve is talking to a lot of the organs in here to help slow things down. And so even though he's the wanderer and he comes out of the head, he can be really important in helping treat certain kinds of epilepsy. So this will give you an idea of what you need to kind of study to finish up chapter 14. Remember your quizlet cards are available. We will be starting chapter 16 in the next class. Make sure you have it printed and also be ready to be in lab during your normal time. Um, to work on the cranial nerve lab, which is lab number 21. Um, have a great Monday and Tuesday, and I will see you guys later in the week.